Hello, it's April 2022, and I'd like to do a video sharing some audio recordings that I've never shared before. And this audio recordings are with the two detectives that were allegedly investigating the assault on me. And I do recall in 2015, that's when I had taken over the trial proper for the criminal charges of alleged assaulting a police officer and alleged obstruction. And this particular interview lasted four hours and I was dealing with my post-traumatic stress was still impacting me a lot. So you'll hear that throughout the, um, these samples. Now, I did talk to detectives about what I knew at the organization with the sexual abuse or trafficking of vulnerable women, whatever you want to call it, on several occasions and try to give them as much information as possible. Now, at the beginning of this interview, I spend maybe 45 minutes, an hour, going through the backstory prior to the May 4th, 2013 assault on me by the two former police officers. And I'm sharing this to show that I made every attempts to try to tell people about what I knew what was going on and at the end of this uh, the audio recordings now I don't give any for example any uh, written commentary to it I do include screenshots throughout of different pieces of evidence independent evidence just to highlight what what, what I was saying at the time and uh, just let you listen to it and for whatever it's worth, make your own conclusions. And at the end of this, I'm going to say a few things. Okay, so it looks like I'm recording. Perfect. And by the way, that's the recorder that I've, I used that was confiscated, that was erased. Okay, same one? Same one. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, I'll just, uh, I'll just get us started here by just doing a, just a, a brief introduction just for... Um, just for the purposes of the recording. So the time, what time is it? It's just 10-19, uh, December 2nd, 2015. Yeah, 2015, and we're at the West Winds Main Building. And uh, this is uh, an audio video recorded interview regarding PSS. It's uh, an issue. I had uh, emailed actually the judge, um, two emails, which are under seal. and. He's decided to keep them under seal, and he'll be, I guess, determining uh, if he's, if and when he's going to be reviewing them. Okay. And that was agreed. So with all that, uh, um, um, December 2012, I was made aware through Mr. that there was uh, an allegation, and there was another person. Um, I don't know his last name. Uh, apparently, we were uh, being investigated for sexually assaulting her. And she had told me this herself. Um, at the end of the day, I, I knew there was an officer there. I had seen him. No one had spoke to me about it. And um, when at the end of the day, I'm like, like, what are you talking about? And then and out loud, there's, and this is at the end of the day, so the people are there. She goes, uh, you and Dan are being investigated for raping me. And I'll never forget that I, that was, um, yeah, I was speechless from, and there's people around, so now I have, I'm just in shock. By the time we walked that 10 feet to the next set of doors, um, <coughs> I was like really emotional. I told her to get the fuck away from me. Um, I, I was just like, you know, shocked. Mm -hmm. I had walked out. The rest is history. No one wanted to talk to me. And all I knew at the time was, according to, uh, there was an um, anonymous tip to a third party, which ended up uh, being uh, a university professor who had no connection to the organization. The only connection was that that was a friend. 
That's where I drew that connection okay. uh, through an untraceable email. That's what he told me. That's and nobody wanted to talk to me about it. Okay, and I'm sorry to interrupt you. Just just for the record, the director. I wasn't a director okay. um, when I first started. Uh, I was I was hired by uh, Dr. John Rook, and you're aware of that information. Yes. Okay. And um, soon after, because of my background and whatever. Um, the, he, he was talking to me about taking um, a higher position. He was, uh, I didn't uh, uh, apply for the executive director position because within the first two or three weeks I realized there was something not right, really not right. Uh, I, went, I've, I went through a hard period in life um, and I didn't want to get involved. Um, I just had too much uh, on my plate in my personal life. I just wanted to, you know, get established. And, but I remember during that time there was a um, Alberta Health Services had come in and interviewed the staff. And I remember being interviewed um, in a small little boardroom off on the side. I believe it was. Uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, she was sitting to my right, and there was one or two people towards the end of the table, and they were just asking me about the and what I knew about it and so forth. He left, and it was kind of abrupt um, how he left, and the official story was uh, he went to pursue his, uh, he had an opportunity for his dream job, which... Okay, whatever. And by this time, as you're aware, um, I was made known of some some things. Comes aboard, and um, right off the top, we had some issues. Like just started off as character issues, and um, whatever. And then that story starts to go. Sure. I, I resigned. I forget the exact dates, but there you should have. I it. do have. Yeah, that was in November. Uh, he asked, uh, tried to intervene to help, specifically some female members' concerns. So I guess uh, I didn't even realize my value until actually I did leave. People were crying and stuff. Anyway. Um, so I resigned in November. I said, "Listen, can we work things out?" And so, but I, you know, I resigned, and I'm like, I don't have a job, you know, to go to. So I figured, okay, this will buy me some time and make a transition <coughs> easier. Um, he went around, and told everyone that I rescinded my resignation. I emailed him to clarify I didn't, mm -hmm. and then so at some point there was uh, the ish the event with Miss allegation and I knew she had something to do with it and I knew uh, she had something to do with it just based on what little information I know no one wanted to speak to me which raised my concerns um, the police even out of human com common courtesy should have just said hey listen you know this is what nobody said a word so with, from that point to the May 4th event, there's already recordings. So I'm going to rely on the facts. Um, one, I don't want to misquote or, or something and then it contradict um, any specific information over those four months. I, I did what I had to do for my own best interest because no one else was looking after my own best interest. And I'm sure both of you guys would be able, you know, if somebody out made an allegation like that, you would be taking it seriously. However, you guys have the advantage of being police officers and you can, you know, do your own little inquiries and stuff. I don't have that luxury, mm -hmm. right? So and that was the purpose for making some recordings, just to, you were trying to clear your name. I was, there was, there was, my primary focus in the beginning, in the first recording, was to clear my name. I, I, but I realized I had a, some job prospects and stuff, which um, 
Later I found out that it was interfering with, but that's a different topic. So my objective was to prove my innocence, um, gather some information that I knew with regards to the affidavit that you're aware of, as well as he didn't pay me money he owed me, so I needed something to go after him and um, So, I mean, there was like multiple things, and then I ran into her in, into the mall. Was I remember I was I had come back from job, you know, and I think it was like about two thirty or three o'clock in the afternoon. I, I, I now that would have to reflect to uh, text messages that I had sent to a former colleague who also quit. A, a bunch of people had quit while I was there, staff. Um, I guess uh, they had uh, their own uh, issues, knowledge, whatever, and they were smart. I should have left too soon. But looking back, the only mistake I, if you want to call it that, that I made was as soon as I was aware of it, I should have just left. But <coughs> whatever. So with all that said, I. Um, I was sitting at the food court and I said, seen her coming up, so I immediately texted um, a former colleague who we were friends. Um, now, I had told about John Rook, uh, Dr. John Rook, and um, I think I told this guy, but uh, was, she was aware of all that. So I ran into her. Uh, so I asked who I texted, because I'm thinking, okay, I'm. I got to start documenting. Um, over the four months prior to the event, it was extremely challenging for me. Um, you could, there's even recordings like when I, uh, after I would drop her off close to her house, I, you know, I'm like, I remember just talking out loud, like, I hope this is worth it. Like, this is nuts. Like, I shouldn't, you know, I'm just, you know, but that would summarize my, my, uh, not notes, but like summarize thoughts if I had any after I dropped her off, mm -hmm. had it on, on record. So I, I, I try to document everything. And trust me, like as a human being, that's the, the, the craziest thing you can do. Like you're like, am I, am I going overboard? Am I nuts? Like, but I have, who do I talk to? Mm -hmm. My friends are like, you know, um, I have uh, former colleagues and, um, friends, you know, ex, uh, retired police officers and stuff, they're all like, you know, you, you did the right thing. Like, there's no, there's no question. And so, you know, and I trust, you know, trust the um, input of my friends. Like, there's a lot of times where I was trying to talk to her about the who is she talking to. Um, I actually want, she, she, at one point towards the end, she said she was talking to, to, a professional. I said, who, who, who is this person? I said, give them, you know, my number, ask them to text me. I'll call them my email, whatever. Just, you know, I was trying to be really, um, if uh, there's any questions with regards to Dr. John Rook, there's some, so it's very dangerous to do that. But I know there's, there's, these men are very influential in the city, very deep pockets. I was told that. And um, I didn't want anything to do with, with that. I just really just wanted a simple life. And uh, you can hear in the audio recording that I made in December 2012 with uh, Miss and myself, who I referred to as Everyone, yeah. yeah, just, you know, so everybody knows. Um, at one point, when you listen to the full audio recording, um, she was, like, basically taunting me to help. And I'm like, I clearly say this is not my fight. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't. But it turned out to be my fight. So 
if we can now, if, we, if we're all good, we can move forward to the May 4th event. Sorry for dragging this no, on. No, I, I, I know there's, there's, we, know, we know that you're setting context. So, um, so yeah, why don't, why don't you tell us about sort of what led you up to being, uh, or, or what you can start at the, start at the uh, Now, when this interview was done and I was walking out the main doors of the building, these were the same two detectives that said to me, no one cares what you have to say. And I remember I was completely taken off guard. It came out so randomly. I just remember I just kind of stood there and looked at, looked at them both. And the one that was to my left looked at the other one who said it uh, on my right, like very sternly, best description I can think of. I was just, I remember thinking like, why? And I reflect back on my life. There was the time when uh, a gang, about, I don't know, it was 12 or 14 uh, others. I was, I was after school. I was uh, junior high. And they beat me, left me for dead. Long story short, they got, they got off and the police came with this guy and said that he just wanted to say sorry. I didn't accept the apology. I was a, you know, a teenager. I don't know how old you'd be. I, you know, I think about that. I think about when it was, um, the late eighties anyway, I think it was 88 where I was sexually assaulted by five to six female nurses in a recovery room of a hospital. And the police told me, and I was going to the police, you know, saying, hey, you know, this happened to me. And they threatened to charge me with something. And I remember them saying to me, why would you want to do that to people who help others? And I talk about this, actually there's a whole video dedicated to that story. And I spent almost 10 years off and on trying to pursue that. And even had lawyers filing police complaints on my behalf. Now there's lawyers doing it because the police wouldn't listen to me. And the irony is that's showing up on CPIC, the police computer database. Every country has one of sexual assault complaints. Keep in mind, this is over years. And I found out, I believe it was in June 2013, that my sexual assault complaints were showing up, but not clear that I was a complainant. And I could never understand why I was being told throughout my life, my adult life, that I'm a sexual offender. And then I found out June yeah, June 2013. There's already recordings of that. And it's it just, I just, I, I just don't get, I, I really don't understand why when it comes to dealing with police in my personal life, I've never been treated with respect and no one cares to listen to me anyway take what you will from these audio recordings I'm just further supporting my attempts to whistleblow and expose and it cost me everything and now I'm partly disabled and destitute as a result of my efforts with everything going sideways because of two former police officers whatever whatever their they thought was going on or who knows I, I don't know everything went sideways for everyone but yet I'm the one carrying the burden of it all anyway thank you for watching please like subscribe comment and share Listen to this and write it down if you can't remember it. You're never going to outgrow warfare. 
You simply must learn to talk. I hear people saying to me all the time, when is it going to get easier? When you die. 